everybody, thanks for joining. My name is Ashish Padani. I'm the Vice President General Manager for OpenShift Containers Group at Red Hat. And today we're going to have uh, a chance to talk about taking containers from experiment to enterprise. Um, I believe we have some uh, time left over towards the end for a question and answer. And we'll try to address as many questions as we have in the time we have. And if we can't get to them all, then we'll have an opportunity to follow up with you. Um, with that, let me move to the next slide. So the first thing I want to start off with, and you might have heard about this uh, from several others uh, in your interactions in the industry, is that fundamentally software is disrupting every business. Red Hat's belief is that every company is either a software company or needs to develop a strong competency around software. I've listed a few examples here you know, of some companies in North America as well as other parts of the world uh, where this kind of transformation is taking place. Right? So if you have a conversation uh, with a company that's a credit card issuer, they will tell you that competition is not just other credit card issuers, but also uh, emerging ways to make payments, right? whether it's Apple Pay uh, or fintech startups. Uh, a couple of the examples listed are uh, one about Capital One. Capital One is a leading bank and credit card company in North America. And uh, they've uh, decided to significantly enhance their design capability by acquiring a software design firm. Um, and really what they were trying to focus on is the notion that millennials, the next generation of users of technology, consumers, really want uh, uh, an interactive experience to be able to engage with their financial services institutions. So they felt like they need to develop some expertise and capability around uh, design. Uh, Walmart's another example of a company um, that has taken a lot of technologies developed in-house and actually put it out in the open source community uh, to get more collaboration, uh, to get more folks engaged with uh, participating in their platform as well as advancing it in the future. And so the top trends that we're seeing today, I've been interacting with customers all around the world, right? so whether it's in North America, whether it's in Europe uh, or parts of Asia, you know, are around these four areas. You know, I'll start with the right, uh, with the notion of an adoption of a cloud-based architecture. So customers everywhere um, are thinking really hard about taking advantage of the scale and the economics of uh, cloud-based infrastructure, right? whether it's private cloud, you know, a public cloud option, or the notion of hybrid cloud. Customers want to make sure that they are prepared uh, to be able to move their application services uh, to take advantage of those environments. Uh, on the left, there's a lot of talk from a senior leadership perspective around the notion of becoming uh, much more agile, in fact, taking agile to the next level by introducing the notion of DevOps to their organizations. Now, DevOps is as much about cultural change, about behavior change, about organizational change, as it's about technology. But really, the notion is about how can you deliver applications faster than you have done before? How can you update services quicker? Uh, very famously, Jeff Bezos of Amazon used to talk about a two pizza team. Right? This notion that if you can have you know, small teams that can work on individual application services, you know, that they can be delivered to market faster. And that's related to the concept of microservices based architectures. The notion that you, know, you can take uh, existing applications or build new applications that are not monolithic in nature, but fundamentally are made up of much smaller pieces that you can be able to decompose then you can independently scale them up or down, as the case may be, change them, as well as be able to interact with APIs and share the services that you've developed with those from third parties, you know, be they your customers or your partners, to have a much more effective um, platform, as well as an ecosystem around what you deliver. The key underlying um, technology, or what I'll call the enabler uh, of these trends, is the notion of containers. And containers isn't necessarily something uh, brand new. It's been developed in uh, Linux. In fact, you know, a container is a Linux process, uh, and it's been in the public domain for over 10 years. Um, in fact, Google made some of the earliest contributions uh, to the Linux kernel uh, for containers. But it's really taken the world by storm. Customers around the world are simply thinking about how they can adopt containers. A great amount of awareness today, uh, and also lots of large organizations that have begun the journey as well as put many application services in it. Uh, and the value that containers can bring right, is to be able to deliver services faster, be able to create much greater uh, portability of their applications across different environments, uh, and create much greater flexibility. Right? So the notion of bringing that flexibility of a developer develops an application or service, 
uh, is able to hand it over to the production team or sysadmin, and that uh, can be pushed out uh, and run live right away. You know, it's a powerful one, uh, and containers are a key enabling technology to make that happen. Uh, as we can see from some of the research that's out there, and this is based on uh, a study done of uh, professionals uh, across the US, UK, Germany, China, and India, is that firms everywhere uh, are looking at containers uh, and, and, and uh, thinking about trying to run them in production. So with regard to a dev test perspective, it's extremely high uh, on everyone's agenda, and the companies that are more forward leaning uh, have also been aggressively uh, pushing them into the production. Now we talk to a lot of customers you know, who are thinking about you know, how they can scale up their development teams to be proficient in these areas, and we'll talk a lot more about what that means. To help better understand uh, container adoption, we have had decided to map that out into four phases. Now the point of these stages of container adoption is not to say that every company has to start from the left uh, and end up at the right, uh, but it's more to give companies uh, essentially a guide rail or a set uh, of steps to take in the journey uh, as they go towards transformation. So, uh, on the left is uh, stage one uh, called the adopt phase. This is the notion of being able to try to uh, develop productivity with containers, right? Getting your development teams familiar with it, starting to uh, engage with some lightweight applications, uh, getting some expertise around it, uh, ensuring that they can start uh, developing those containers on their local environments, their desktops or their laptops, uh, and you know, giving them docs, examples, and samples uh, to get them going. The next stage is what I'll call the expand phase. Right. The moment the developers start getting comfortable with these uh, container-based technologies uh, and they hand it over to their friendly sysadmin, right, it's sometimes where the DevOps problem starts to occur. Right? So if it works fine uh, on their laptop when they've you know, dropped it over the wall, uh, they find out that you know, the teams aren't able to run it in production due to any number of reasons. Right? You know, there might be you know, a mismatch between, let's say, the application or web server the developer used versus what was being run on the server. Uh, there could be some uh, issues with regard to whether the software was supported or was it patched, was it secure, uh, was it a brand new technology the production team was aware of. You know, it could be one of any number of reasons, right? But that's the second stage where the server uh, administration teams have to start getting comfortable, start, uh, getting comfortable with these container technologies to be able to start staging you know, how they're going to be run. Right, this is where you know, key building blocks you know, have to be put up before you can get to the commit stage, right, which I'll call is the third stage uh, in this journey. Uh, and that's when companies start thinking about why to deploy app containers in production. Right? So by now, companies have gotten familiar with you know, introducing containers uh, into their pipelines, being able to do CI, CD, be able to run through various tests, st stage it, and then start running uh, applications in production in certain business groups. Uh, for this, they need uh, you know container platform. They definitely need some operational management uh, and production support uh, in case something goes down, and be able to manage, patch, update uh, the containers that are running. The final stage is the transform stage, and transform is really when enterprises are fully committed and want to completely transform their organizations to embrace all aspects of running in the cloud with uh, DevOps-based best practices. Uh, as well as have full microservices based uh, architectures. Uh, we offer obviously a lot of technologies to help companies in that journey, but this can do things like being able to manage across various environments, uh, containers that are running in one environment, maybe virtual machines that are running in another environment, be able to potentially think of running uh, these in various public clouds uh, or in a private cloud IS OpenStack based environment, uh, as well as have flexible storage options. Next, what I wanted to do was map these various stages uh, with the evolution of the container market. And this is as much to give uh, our users, uh, developers, uh, operations folks uh, around the world some sense of how this market has been changing uh, and where we are in that journey. So on the left, the adopt stage can briefly be described as uh, the advent of uh, the Docker-based technology in the marketplace. Right, and Red Hat was, of course, one of the first major technology companies to completely embrace the Docker format in the year 2013. We decided to adopt it uh, and support it as a 
first class bases in, in our Red Enterprise Linux as well as our OpenShift platform. The next phase in 2014 was uh, a lot of increased interest in what I'll call container optimized operating systems right from Red Hat as well as others in the marketplace. Uh, ours is called Atomic Host and it's built on uh, all of the capabilities that customers expect around Enterprise Linux 7. Uh, but what it does is obviously slims it down to focus on being able to run containers at scale. Another uh, very important development that happened uh, there was the introduction of the Kubernetes based project. This is based on a lot of experience that companies like Google have running containers at scale. In fact, Google runs over 2 billion containers a week. A lot of the uh, mail, uh, docs, uh, and so on, other technologies from Google do run containers. Uh, and Red Hat has been a significant contributor into the Kubernetes-based project uh, to really introduce container orchestration at large scale for companies. Stage three is commit stage and industry events that have happened around that is just uh, standardization efforts. And we think that's a hugely positive uh, step in the marketplace to be able to standardize around uh, these emerging technologies, right? And the two that I want to call out are Open Container Initiative and the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, OCI, or Open Container Initiative, is standardization around some of the Docker-based container uh, runtimes. And it's really uh, amazing to see the number of companies that have participated in it and are, have uh, started supporting this area. And some of those companies include obviously not just Red Hat, but also Docker Inc., uh, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, IBM, VMware, and many others. Cloud Native Computing Foundation uh, is part of the Linux Foundation, uh, and that's the home of the Kubernetes based technology. And again, uh, it's not just Google and Red Hat, but many others in the industry that are also participating uh, in that project. Uh, but so this is really a lot about you know, various uh, major participants in the industry committing to uh, the evolution that's happening in the container market and providing a set of standardization so enterprises, users, developers can get more comfortable with what's being made available in the marketplace. From Red Hat's perspective, of course, uh, you know, we've done a lot of work uh, to introduce uh, a Docker Kubernetes-based uh, technology platform called OpenShift which allows you to manage uh, and run containers at scale. Now we also have done work um, to have a greater ecosystem certification uh, around the partners uh, of Red Hat that are providing containers that can run in an environment. And of course, there's also been a lot of change in the marketplace with new vendors, new entrants into the market. And the final stage, which I think we're in now, uh, from an industry perspective, and I believe it'll last for the next few years, uh, is this transform stage. And we'll see uh, you know, all the changes that are happening in it, but we believe fundamentally uh, that most enterprises will be adopting these technologies, completely transforming their infrastructures to take advantage of what's happening. Uh, you know, we've already seen you know, how, for example, when security exploits happen, you know, how we need to react to them. We've been doing a lot of work ourselves, both uh, within the organization, but also contributing it to uh, our upstream community um, you know, in the open source manner that Red Hat has been doing for two decades. Uh, but we've also been doing a fair amount of work expanding our container portfolio and I'll cover that in some more detail in the upcoming slides. So with regard to container uh, adoption, you know, we've heard from uh, a lot of the users and this slide gives you some sense of the survey uh, data that we found was the concerns. Uh, and enterprise, of course, have several concerns. Uh, and some of the concerns, obviously, should be easy to guess. Uh, the top ones are on security. Uh, scalability is another one. Uh, performance, you know, if customers are used to how VMs run or how applications are traditionally running, um, this concern about you know, how this emerging technology will support uh, their high-performing applications. Uh, integration with their existing infrastructure as well as services. And then, you know, how are these container technologies going to be managed at scale? You know, the good news is that the industry is working together to help address a lot of these problems. Red Hat, of course, is doing its share, maybe even more than its share, uh, both in uh, contributing to upstream communities, but also to work across the entire portfolio to help address some of these concerns. The next slide really talks about you know, the role of the OS. And the point of this is not uh, trying to talk about you know, the greater adoption of Linux versus Windows. Uh, I think the, the more salient point is the fact that 
since containers fundamentally are a Linux-based technology, you know, we're seeing a lot of Linux adoption happen, uh, underlying all the, uh, the biggest public clouds that you see out there, uh, as well as the private cloud-based infrastructures. Windows Server itself is getting re-architected uh, to support containers, and we think that's an extremely positive move you know, for the industry. And in fact, at the most recent Red Hat Summit, what we did see was, uh, as part of the, the greater Microsoft and Red Hat partnership, Microsoft announced that .NET Core 1.0 would be supported on Enterprise Linux, as well as on OpenShift, which means now you can have containerized our .NET application that can be developed, deployed, and run and managed uh, in these environments, but also demonstrate a SQL Server being containerized uh, and run with Enterprise Linux as well as OpenShift. Uh, and so having a, an operating system that can support these various environments, right? whether you're using .NET applications now uh, or uh, taking advantage of Java, Node JavaScript, uh, or C, or Perl, or Python, and being able to support them to run in a flexible manner uh, is going to be key. And having an operating system that fundamentally works with containers at its very heart um, and supporting them is also going to be extremely important for enterprises to allay their fears and concerns. Uh, with regard to the different options uh, in this new landscape, you know, there are several choices that uh, you know, customers have. And, and we believe that's a good thing. We believe that creates awareness uh, in the marketplace. You know, as users of this technology, you know, my sense is that you're probably looking at some or several of these options. Uh, and, and that's giving you some sense of you know, the amount of change that's happening in the marketplace. On the left is what I'll call DIY or do-it-yourself. Uh, and customers are starting to get familiar. They're experimenting with Docker and Kubernetes and many other technologies that are out in the marketplace uh, in the open source community uh, and playing with it and trying to figure out you know, how they can leverage that uh, to develop these applications. Uh, and the next thought over is what I'll call the traditional enterprise or past providers. Uh, and these are companies that are trying to uh, retain the position as the market's changing. What we're finding is they are, in some sense, you know, focused more just on uh, cloud-native or 12-factor stateless applications only versus addressing the full gamut uh, of applications that traditional enterprises have right, that uh, cover stateless as well as stateful applications. Um, over from that right, is uh, some of the emerging companies, the startups, uh, that are really creating a lot of awareness in the marketplace. Right? They're introducing new solutions. Of course, you know, their biggest challenge is the search for a viable business model, the search for a sustainable value proposition. Uh, to customers, uh, but you know there are many of these companies that we collaborate with in the marketplace as well. Uh, and finally, on the right is the public cloud. And of course, the public cloud is appropriate. There's lots of uh, great advancements that are happening there that are appropriate for, for many customers. But what we also hear is that customers don't want to get locked in into one single offering uh, in a public cloud. They want to, be able to take advantage of the multiple services that these uh, clouds are providing. Um, and at the heart of each one of these, right, is that when you're using any of these technologies, if you aren't careful, you might end up with a custom Linux distribution, mostly because you know, uh, different containers, when they run and manage at scale, do need an underlying host Linux operating system. Uh, and that's the one that takes care of being able to help uh, with regard to updating uh, security and, and being able to be patched and managed at scale. Uh, and to the extent that you know, if it's not certified to run on a variety of different environments, you know, customers might end up with a situation where they're running software uh, that isn't something that they are being able to support or lifecycle in a, in a production uh, on in a production environment. So to reiterate, our focus is around driving standardization. On the left, you know, uh, is the isolation of Linux containers. I made this point earlier uh, that containers are fundamentally a Linux concept. And when customers work with the containers, taking advantage of things in the Linux kernel, like control groups and namespaces, and many of these technologies have been contributed uh, by companies that are active in contributing upstream to the Linux community. The next one over is the container format. We have the Open Container Initiative. And again, that's something that we've standardized on that we support. Uh, we're doing a significant amount of work contributing both to the Open Container Initiative as well as Kubernetes-based container orchestration. Uh, and then now with the latest releases of our technology platform, you'll see that we're providing registry that can either be pre-populated by trusted third-party software or by containers that uh, are created by your organization 
uh, to ensure that we have a standard way of discovering them as well as consuming these technologies. The key to the basis of uh, photoplate consistency across the four footprints is being able to have a common platform across them. And by the four footprints, what I mean is running containers directly on physical servers of bare metal, running them in a virtualized environment, and we support running our platform uh, on uh, VMware, Red Hat's virtualization technologies, as well as Microsoft Hyper-V, running it in private cloud, so that's uh, infrastructure as a service, an open stack offering, uh, running it on one of the big public clouds, you know, whether it's Amazon Web Services, Azure Google Cloud. And we actually have customers that are taking advantage of running them across all of these different environments. So now to spend a few minutes talking about the Red Hat Container Portfolio because I've given you a lot of background uh, on why containers, why they're important, some of the concerns around it, some of the work that we're doing to ensure that there is uh, a laying of those fears uh, as well as extending out an overall ecosystem to help you adopt this technology. On the left, you know, I've broken up uh, some of the categories that you're familiar with, and I did introduce you know, one that might be new to some of you. So infrastructure as a service, you know, as I mentioned before, we run across the four footprints. We take advantage of the enterprise Linux as well as atomic host container optimized OS and to provide all the value around that uh, to our customer base. Uh, PaaS, many of you are familiar with the notion of platform as a service or uh, application service that are provided by us. I'll come right back to that. But the new term that I want to introduce is CAS, or C-A-S, containers as a service. And what that really means is that's the notion of being able to orchestrate, schedule, manage containers uh, in a diverse environment. Think about how you're rolling out applications, how if you need to roll back, how that's going to happen, monitoring those containers, thinking about container health, uh, some of the capacity planning and policies that go into that as well as uh, authenticating and authorization against various users and systems. Uh, from Red Hat's perspective, we also do a fair amount of work uh, around lifecycle automation or providing uh, developers and users self-service. Uh, we have some technology that we have introduced into our platform and obviously made available in the open source uh, community as well called Source to Image. And the notion there is not every developer, not every user is going to become uh, a, a Docker container ex expert. And if they're not, you can just bring their source code, their binaries, their Euro war files, and uh, the OpenShift container platform will containerize that for them, introduce it into its pipelines, and work with you know, CI, CD, with uh, Jenkins that it provides, as well as integrate with maybe a Jenkins setup that the customer has on its own, and be able to automate that entire process. Um, and this we found you know, is extremely powerful to many of our customers. We've done a lot of work to make that development experience much easier for users. Along, obviously, with starting to develop with your containers and containerizing uh, some of the applications that you have, there's also the notion of being able to have a series of application services. And from our perspective, we've taken the entire middleware portfolio that we have and containerized it. Right? So, if you want to use our application services, we containerize our Tomcat-based uh, application environment also uh, JBoss EAP Java EE application servers containerized, as well as Fuse integration services, active MQ messaging services, uh, PPM BRMS, uh, as well as our mobile backend service that was technology acquired via acquisition of a company called Feed Henry, uh, and most recently acquired a company in the API management area called Freescale, and soon that will be available as well at the user for technology platform. Also within the OpenShift container platform, we provide cloud forms for uh, monitoring and managing uh, the OpenShift environment. Uh, in addition to that, the same cloud form can be extended to manage virtual machines that are running maybe in a VMware environment um, or those that are running outside in AWS or Microsoft Hyper-V. Uh, so it's a very extensible platform. We, of course, provide a series of APIs so you can hook into maybe some existing management and monitoring tool that you have um, or also third-party frameworks, right, whether you have some monitoring tools of your own that you acquire from a third-party ISV, or you want to take advantage of uh, databases uh, that come from third parties. The platform has been architected, since we're talking about databases, 
to support not just stateless, which is the cloud native 12 factor stateless uh, style of applications, but also persistent, more established stateful applications. And we're finding that that's extremely powerful for customers that have a large application portfolio that consists you know, of both kinds of applications. Uh, we've also provided ability to be able to take advantage of uh, various storage options uh, supporting NFS, iSCSI, as well as, well as connecting into uh, cloud storage uh, via Amazon, Google, and others as well. So the point of this slide really is to give you a sense of you know, the vastness of uh, the environment that the Open Container Platform uh, is providing to customers. Uh, and again, the point is not that any customer, any user has to adopt every single one of these to take advantage of our platform. You can start with as little as you want, uh, maybe just simply starting with some developer self-service or just standing this up in your own uh, private cloud uh, and then being able to add and work with additional capabilities as you get familiar. Uh, down on the right, I've listed some additional uh, capabilities that are also available uh, to our customers. For example, in the next release of OpenShift, which will uh, be out in about a month or so, uh, we also include a registry, uh, and, I, and we believe that that's also going to be uh, something that's important uh, to our customer base. An right, obvious next question is, well, these all sound really good. You know, where exactly are containers being deployed? Uh, and, and the good news is that you know, we've got a lot of customers that we've been able to work with so far for deploying these containers uh, and running them at scale. I want to call out a few on this page, uh, and there's, of course, much more public information available uh, about many of these that you can read up on. Um, but Amadeus is a company based out of Europe. It's in the, the travel uh, technology business, uh, serves about 90% of the world's airlines, and obviously uh, helps in uh, hotel reservation systems and many other forms of travel, providing the underlying technology around it. We've been working closely with Amadeus from day one when we launched OpenShift version 3 uh, over a year ago. Uh, they were one of our, our key partners and collaborators uh, in that journey. Uh, and they've completely embraced this uh, container-based uh, large-scale uh, environment, and they're running that uh, today. Uh, what Amadeus is really trying to address uh, is that you know, it realized uh, that it, it was, had a look-to-book -to ratio that it uh, considered a metric. Uh, and by look to book, it really means the ratio of searches uh, to the amount of transactions that happen as well as the searches. And that, they said, was in the uh, area of about 1,000 to 1. Uh, and that would get complete, uh, keep getting higher uh, as a result of uh, the amount of interest and competition in the marketplace. By adopting uh, OpenShift Container Platform, what they found was they can really uh, take advantage of uh, running the platform closer to where their customers are, being able to deliver a higher performance system with lower latency, which of course uh, makes them serve the customer's needs better uh, and drives greater value uh, to its usage. Uh, we find Amadeus today is working with the OpenShift platform, running it uh, in a virtualized environment uh, on OpenStack as well as testing it on running it on Google Cloud Platform as well as AWS. They take advantage of the self-service capabilities of it as well, uh, as well as uh, putting modern applications and running them matching them at scale. So clearly a great a case study, and in fact, they were awarded Red Hat Innovator of the Year at a most recent uh, Red Hat Summit uh, for the groundbreaking work they're doing with the platform. Um, other interesting uh, case studies uh, are some of the big, large global banks like Banco Santander uh, and BBVA Bank. You know, those companies are undergoing complete digital transformations. So I talked earlier about this notion of banks. Uh, considering uh, digital startups or fintech or emerging companies also as competition. Uh, and both these banks have completely embraced that notion uh, and decided to ensure that their environment was flexible, that they were able to deliver applications and services faster. Uh, and they've adopted OpenShift, OpenStack, as well as our cloud forms management technology to ensure that they can run their applications in a much more flexible manner uh, than they, they have in the past. Uh, Orange, the large telecom uh, carrier and service provider based out of France, is taking advantage of the OpenShift platform by running it in an innovation lab. Uh, and there are many other customers as well uh, that are using OpenShift, some of whom presented at the most recent Red Hat Summit. Now, another example uh, is SwissRail, which is using OpenShift as its uh, backend for uh, its mobile reservation application that is available on phones. 
uh, and finding great value by being able to do that. And so I wanted to also share some uh, news that we announced at our most recent Red Hat Summit that happened in June. Uh, and so this, the significant announcements and why they can be important to you as a user. Uh, well, the first thing that we did was ensure that customers uh, understood the value that OpenShift was providing. We actually renamed uh, our base platform from OpenShift Enterprise to call it OpenShift Container Platform. Uh, making sure customers and users understood that you know, it was uh, helping serve the needs of wanting to run containers at scale and manage and orchestrate them, uh, as well as providing the platform service, the application service that can provide great value uh, to our customers. Uh, and so we believe that we want to, uh, the value of both of those uh, are extremely important to our users and we want to communicate that uh, directly to our customers. Um, along with that, we also wanted to make sure we mapped uh, our products to these four uh, uh, phases of the journey that I talked about earlier uh, so customers can map the container adoption they're doing with regard uh, to the technology offerings from that hat. First part of the journey was, uh, if you remember, adopt, focused at developer adoption. Uh, we introduced uh, Red Hat OpenShift Container Local. Uh, again, same software that powers uh, all of our environments, but this one uh, is free to use for developers uh, on your desktop or laptop, uh, free to work with, of course, and focused on uh, ensuring that there's familiarity uh, with our platform to be able to start uh, developing containers. The next stage of the journey was really about starting to put this uh, into a, a testing phase uh, and for that we introduced a new offering called Red Hat OpenShift Container Lab. Again, same software platform uh, but with a different SLA uh, and usage pattern focused on uh, ensuring that uh, when companies start uh, themselves on the journey, the ops teams uh, become familiar with it and can start staging this uh, in their own environment. The third stage journey was about putting this uh, into uh, production in the commit stage. Uh, and for that, we have, of course, a Red Hat OpenShift container platform uh, that can be supported uh, in production with uh, service level that support around the 24 by 7, uh, as well as you know, a certified ecosystem around it. Uh, and the for the final stage, the complete transformation is Red Hat Cloud Suite. That includes not just the OpenShift platform, but also OpenStack cloud management tools, virtualization, uh, as well as many other technologies for use of customers. Uh, just a couple of weeks before that summit, we actually announced an updated version of Red Hat OpenShift Online. Uh, for those who've been following along on the, on the OpenShift journey, we launched the platform f over four years ago, and we've had uh, more than 3.2 million applications that have been deployed in the public cloud. We manage uh, our public cloud offering on a multi-tenant basis. And we've now updated it with a new version three based technology. So this is now the first multi-tenant based, you know, uh, Docker container, Kubernetes, container orchestration technology supported public cloud offering. It's in developer preview right now. And so I encourage you to apply uh, to get access uh, to that offering. We believe that can provide uh, a lot of interesting use uh, for developers to start getting familiar with the platform in the public cloud. Uh, another offering that we've had in the market for a while uh, is called Red Hat OpenShift Dedicated. Uh, and in that case, uh, customers are in control of their own applications. Uh, so it's a single term customer offering, but that's managed by Red Hat's operations team. Uh, we have that available GA on uh, AWS today and so an early testing on Google Cloud Platform as well as Azure. So really the point is, you know, we're trying to map our entire product set against the various stages uh, of a customer's journey, but also provide options to customers regardless of what stage of the journey they're in, uh, both in uh, a private cloud uh, offering uh, for developer usage as well as uh, in the public cloud uh, and also provided uh, management and operations from Red Hat. Other news at Summit, uh, which is very interesting for many of our customers, is we also announced um, container native storage, which is a cluster file system, which we got through our acquisition uh, of the cluster company. And we containerized uh, cluster FS and made that available uh, for users of OpenShift. That's generally available as well. 
Uh, and this is extremely interesting for companies that are interested in having flexible storage options you know, as their storage uh, in, uh, needs increase uh, over a period of time. I did mention briefly uh, the OpenShift Online Next Generation platform. Uh, and the reason uh, that we really, really uh, focused on making sure this comes out is we want to make sure our customers know that in, in many ways, customer number one for our platform is Red Hat itself uh, in that you know, we stand up OpenShift Online directly on AWS. And we've been doing that from, for, uh, from day one. We've been taking advantage of containers ourselves. Uh, by running uh, it on AWS in a multi-tenant fashion uh, and deploying these container workloads at scale, gaining a lot of expertise uh, and our enterprise customers can take advantage of that. But it also enables for our users to be able to uh, get a lot of familiarity with our platform uh, in, in a way that's comfortable for them without having to, uh, to, to download software. Uh, and we focus uh, ourselves on operational management and some of the security updates and patching is handled by us. A new program was announced uh, at Red Hat Summit was OpenShift Primed, uh, and that's a technical readiness program. There was a lot of interest both from our ISV partners as well as our customers uh, to have some third-party software that was being made available on the platform, at least getting a signal of awareness of the work that was happening. I've listed a few of the companies that we're working with, and there are many others as well. Uh, that have been joining the program uh, and the work they're doing is to demonstrate how their uh, software, so whether it's you know Nuage Networks or Juniper Contrail and the work they're doing to extend uh, out the platform from an SDN, a software defined networking perspective, uh, our partners like Couchbase and MongoDB providing database options, uh, additional tools uh, or applications for users, whether it's GitLab, Nginx and many others, NetApp recently joined the program as well. Uh, and what partners are doing is showing uh, the work that they're doing uh, to get the software ready for the platform, but also customers get a sense uh, of uh, the new upcoming software that's going to be made available uh, for their use uh, and that's certified by these uh, partners of, of Red Hat uh, for, for uh, value that they can start taking advantage of once they're starting to run the platform at greater scale. Uh, I wanted to go back maybe to one of the earliest concerns that I laid out uh, based on the feedback we got from our users around security. Uh, also Red Hat Summit, we announced a uh, new uh, container scanning capability. And really the notion here was that uh, when you uh, go and access one of the, the Docker images, Docker files that are available um, out on the web, and right now there might be over you know, a few hundred thousand that are made available. The question is, you know, you may not know whether those are secure, whether they have contained any kind of vulnerabilities, whether you're putting uh, your company, your organization, uh, your cluster at risk. Uh, and so what we announced was uh, some container scanning, so whereby you download uh, or introduce a new container into your environment, you automatically check against open SCAP, uh, a public database of known vulnerabilities, CVEs, uh, and alert you, and then you can take the appropriate action uh, with regard to the next step, also integrate third-party software coming from Black Duck to provide you additional capabilities in this area. So security is something that's extremely important uh, to Red Hat. You know, we constantly and consistently work on uh, uh, greater security-based uh, uh, capabilities provided to the platform. And this is just one example uh, of some new work that we've done uh, to provide value to our customers. Finally, uh, I also want to talk about uh, a series of options that we provide uh, to enable uh, greater container adoption in your uh, organization. Um, in the past, you know, I've mentioned already Red Hat OpenShift Primed. Um, a new uh, area that we uh, have been introducing is around Red Hat Open Innovation Labs, and that's really a residency that we provide uh, to train a lot of our users around how they can use containers, how they can take advantage of some of the self-service uh, and automation that we provide for developers uh, and get familiar with uh, running these containers. Uh, and that can be done over six to eight weeks uh, with our team to get that expertise and bring that into your company. Uh, but there are also some other areas that uh, we provide from a sort of building and learning perspective uh, that can give you more training and develop more expertise in your uh, organization. There's also the container certification program that we have that uh, 
ensures that both us and the trusted third party ISV uh, has tested a container and we've uh, agreed to life cycle and ensure that it's supported uh, so customers can consume that with ease. And as I mentioned before, we now are also introducing a container registry with the next release of our OpenShift based platform to make it easier uh, to distribute uh, container based content uh, that organizations have. Uh, so with that, I want to close. I know I've covered a lot of material in uh, the last 40 minutes or so, uh, but I want to ensure that uh, you got a sense of you know, the value proposition that we're trying to provide to customers. This is just a quick introduction uh, into the container-based work uh, that we're doing. Uh, the first point I want to make is that you know, the container journey is real and it's happening across the world. Uh, most organizations that we encounter uh, are seriously considering uh, adopting it uh, as the basis of those trends that I mentioned earlier around uh, public or private or hybrid cloud, uh, the DevOps, as well as uh, microservice-based architectures. The work that we're doing uh, is around these areas, right, around security. Uh, I talked about the contribution that we make and the new capabilities that we've introduced uh, to enhance that. Work around portability to ensure that you can run it uh, on the four footprints uh, physical, virtual, private, or public cloud. Uh, the work we're doing in ensuring that it's more manageable and it can be run at scale. And you know, we've been doing uh, work to ensure that we can support uh, thousands of containers that can be run, uh, as well as give you some sense of container-based health. Uh, and then provide a total solution. And the total solution includes uh, the integration of our various uh, middleware technologies. Uh, as part of our uh, application service we provide on Red Hat, uh, including our storage-based uh, file system that's also provided, uh, as well as integration touch points with uh, OpenStack uh, and uh, the other products from the portfolio. So overall, we believe the time is now uh, for you to be able to uh, try out these container-based technologies. Uh, I'll pause now for questions, and if you have other concerns, uh, we're also happy. So I'm just reviewing the questions I received on chat. Um, and the first question I have is, you know, is there a quick demo plan? No, this was just really a presentation to give you a flavor uh, of the work we've been doing overall, uh, the kinds of challenges that we see from enterprise adoption, uh, as well as the work that we're doing to address them. Um, you know, we are happy to be able to schedule that, you know, for you, or you can directly obviously take advantage of our platform. Uh, by downloading it or accessing it via the public cloud. But if there's any follow-up, right, please feel free to email us and we're happy to answer that directly. Uh, the next question, you know, which is a great question, you know, we hear that uh, on a pretty consistent basis, uh, and that's, uh, are containers complementary to VM? You want to be uh, much more flexible with regard to the kind of way you want to run them. Uh, you don't necessarily want some of the overhead uh, with regard to VMs. Your containers are very appropriate for you. Uh, if you've got you know, existing application, like I say, applications are running you know, fine in VMs, and you know, that's not an area that you definitely want to dislodge, right? You, know, you can definitely take uh, advantage of the VMs that you have and keep running them uh, in that fashion. Uh, we actually support running OpenShift directly in a VM-based environment. In fact, we have many customers uh, that do that today. So again, uh, it's all dependent on the use cases. Uh, but in many cases, you know, customers are taking advantage of uh, VMs and in, in several others, you know, a container platform is appropriate for them to run both directly uh, as part of uh, VMs or as a placement for VM-based environments. Uh, the next question is, how is OpenShift different from Docker Container Center? I hope that was clear to you as I went through this presentation. Right? What OpenShift is trying to provide uh, is provide a full and comprehensive environment, right? Uh, covering and spanning not just the CAS, the container service area, but also the application services around it. Uh, I talked significantly about some of the work from a security perspective, as well as the management capabilities, uh, obviously the, the full portfolio of application services, uh, the work we do to ensure that your integration with other uh, products and technologies that might be valuable to you, whether you want to run it in the public cloud or with you know, flexible storage options or SDN. Uh, but so we believe that we provide uh, a very comprehensive offering uh, to address a you know, wide range of concerns. Uh, next question was, uh, can you talk about how partners uh, are using OpenShift, how they benefit, and what are the challenges they've overcome? Again, a great question. 
Um, I think from a partner perspective, uh, and, and partner is a big, big term, right? So I'm not 100% sure of exactly what you mean, right? But we think of partners in very different ways, right? We have partners that are ISVs, so third-party software providers. Um, in many cases, again, I mentioned uh, about who our partners are and the OpenShift Prime program, how we're delivering value there, and then how our customers want to consume uh, the third-party software containers. So there's a value uh, for us to work with partners and for them to provide these certified containers uh, delivering those to our joint customers. Uh, the next area of partners we think about are what I'll call system integrators, right? whether they're the large global system integrators uh, or small regional ones that are focused maybe in a particular industry or vertical uh, or particular class of customers. Uh, in that case, uh, what they're able to do is provide expertise as well as be able to provide additional uh, skill sets to our customers uh, to ensure that they can adopt these containers and be able to run them in the environment uh, and be able to uh, either uh, move applications, migrate applications to this environment or help them create new applications. Uh, and then the third set of partners is around uh, what we call our certified cloud providers. And we have you know, several. One example of that is T-Systems out of Germany uh, that's taking the OpenShift platform and then delivering that as a service offering to their end user enterprise customers. And we work with several around the world to ensure that they can provide a cloud-based offering to them. Um, sorry, I'm just scrolling through questions. The good news is there's a lot of questions, uh, so I'm going to answer as many as I can. Um, the next uh, question, actually it was not one question, but several. Let me just see if I can at least take one of them on. Uh, how are the business applications growing, transforming to support containers still running in legacy mode? Again, excellent question. Right, so uh, there's some analysts you know, who describe applications in terms of mode one or mode two applications, right? So established traditional applications, as well as the more modern new applications. Uh, we're finding uh, customers doing uh, a combination of, let's say, all of the above. Uh, in some cases, customers started the journey by using this platform to run uh, their newer applications, uh, say applications they've been developing, uh, that they can take advantage of all the uh, container-based capabilities uh, that are provided. Uh, there are some others that are taking existing applications and doing some work refactoring, in some cases re-architecting those applications uh, to run these environments. Um, so what we're finding is that uh, customers based on where they're on the journey, what amount of skills and expertise they have, and the amount of confidence they're starting to develop using containers, uh, starting to take advantage of the container platform uh, as uh, they progress along the usage of uh, OpenShift. Uh, next question was, you know, we use Docker, Kubernetes, and many other uh, different projects. How is that uh, different from using our OpenShift platform instead? Excellent question, and what I'll point out, right, is uh, the, an the analogy to this question would be saying, I use, you know, free and open source Linux and its many uh, various libraries. How is that different from using Rare and Rest Linux? Well, the difference really is, you know, open source projects, you know, change on a pretty uh, regular basis. Uh, and of course, there's you know much work that has to happen with regard to stabilizing them, hardening them, and then making them available for enterprise production. Right? We lifecycle that. We uh, provide security updates and patches around that. We make that available in a variety of different environments to run. We also uh, make sure that we certify and support various third-party software that can be run with it. Uh, and so we give that amount of confidence for enterprises to be able to run that, and then we'll stand behind that platform, you know, as things change. Uh, and provide some backward compatibility uh, as versions change as well. Uh, next question was, what is the need to have different uh, containers for different environments, dev, test, or prod? Or prod? Uh, again, that is uh, dependent on you know, separate use cases. We found uh, you know, customer bars that have one environment and they're running you know, test, prod, all of that in, in the same environment. Uh, in certain environment, what we're doing is separating those out and running them as separate clusters. So on the one hand, they want to give a lot of freedom to the developers to try different kinds of technologies, let's say to build applications, right? the notion of you know, helping them innovate or fail fast. Uh, and then they have a separate environment where they've got some pre-certified images of containers that they support in production, or only certain versions that they support in production. Right? So in that case, they've separated them out. So you know, again, there's no hard and fast rule. It's dependent on you know, your particular environment and your particular needs and what you're doing to address them. Uh, next question, I'm not sure if I understand fully, is container compatible with cloud services? So 
we believe that you know containers are a key underlying technology to enable you to take advantage of running in cloud. You can definitely run applications, and customers are doing doing it today, running applications directly on the cloud. You don't necessarily need to containerize it to do that. But we believe containers will provide you a lot of uh, flexibility, a lot of agility, be able to provide you portability uh, across various different environments, right? Whether they are a different public cloud, private cloud, uh, or even more traditional uh, uh, bare metal or VM-based options. Uh, next question, uh, I don't know if this was a little bit tongue-in-cheek, was multiple containers in one machine, does that lead us to one big machine? Um, you know, we're living in a world that's, you know, fundamentally more and more uh, decentralized, right? And we want to make sure we provide you know, an extremely robust uh, platform that can help address that for you, right? So this notion is uh, has become popular. Uh, and some of you may have heard of it called immutable architecture, right? Which is, you know, we don't want to be the business of having to stop a system completely to be able to go off and update it. We want to make sure that we can do it on the fly. Have the system be smart enough to recognize uh, you know, what's up if something is down to be able to go and restart that uh, automatically. So this is really more about having, you know, a system that you can run uh, lots of large applications at scale and have uh, the underlying platform take advantage of and provide a, a lot of automation that in the past we've had to either use scripts or build by hand. Uh, next question was, how much time does it take to move from a physical server to OpenShift containers? What's the average cost of OpenShift hosting? Now, that's a tough question to answer from a cost perspective. Again, that's based on exactly your application environment, how big your own uh, footprint is. Um, and so it can depend, right? In the online uh, case, you know, we have uh, the ability to accept credit cards, right? And people can have some small applications that are paying us a lot. Uh, and then several of our customers are running you know, extremely complex applications and services at a large scale, right? Which are uh, obviously uh, uh, a much more different uh, proposition from a cost perspective. With regard to how many times or days it takes to move, uh, again, that's uh, dependent on customers, right? We found many customers are able to get OpenShift up and running and start, you know, trialing out containers in a day. Uh, so it could take you as little as a day to do it, and of course, if you have something that's much more complex, uh, that requires several steps uh, when you're trying to either port or move some applications over, uh, that might be different. Uh, next question was, will there be additional security considerations one should keep in mind? Well, there's a lot of security considerations to keep in mind. I mean, I started just touching on some of them, and the, this is, you know, a completely, you know, separate topic. I think we've already done some webinars at Red Hat uh, around this, and I'm sure there'll be more coming. Um, but there's a lot of subtleties around this, right, about mismatches that can happen between various different host operating systems that are running in different environments, as well as user space uh, that the container is running in. Right, and if we are careful, right, that's when vulnerabilities creep in, and then you can't maintain, update, manage, and patch them uh, across all these environments. So, uh, the question is a good one, right, and, and one that uh, we need to sort of dive into uh, in a lot more detail. Uh, but security concerns are something that Enterprise Linux directly addresses, and OpenShift Container Platform, because it embeds RHEL and uses that as the basis of containers, uh, also provides. Uh, where can I get more info on uh, OpenShift Container with the adoption stage? So definitely, uh, you know, feel free to contact uh, folks over uh, in the Red Hat team uh, in India or elsewhere, uh, as well as go to our website. Uh, there's uh, lots of opportunities for you to get documentation. Uh, you know, there are blog posts that we put out there, uh, and you know, if that's not sufficient, you know, reach out to us, uh, and we can give you more. Uh, is there an OpenShift ready image available on the web to explore this product? Yes, there is. There's an all-in-one VM that you can use, and that's the one that's focused for usage uh, uh, in the developer's environment. Definitely go off and download that, uh, try that out, uh, and then hopefully you have a good experience and uh, able to start becoming familiar with using containers. Uh, and I think this might be my last question, so thank you for being patient and staying with me. Uh, how tightly is OpenShift coupled with OpenStack uh, or without OpenStack-based platform uh, offerings? Um, again, a good question. Uh, so we have customers sort of, uh, you know, using OpenShift and OpenStack. I think I mentioned at least a couple of them, uh, which is uh, Banco Santander and BBVA Bank. Cisco is also doing that. Uh, and they find a lot of value in having flexibility both in the underlying infrastructure as well as the application platform area. 
Uh, it's not tightly coupled, right? Uh, you know, OpenStack takes advantage of and provides capability around underlying resources, and OpenShift, of course, provides you uh, the automation uh, for running uh, applications as containers and then orchestrating and managing them. Uh, in many other cases, we have customers running it either on VMs. I mentioned also the case of Amadeus that's doing that, as well as running it uh, on uh, a cloud-based environment, uh, Google Cloud, as well as on Amazon. Uh, so customers they can take advantage of uh, all of the above uh, without necessarily having to actually couple to OpenStack or run it on OpenStack and find value. We also have reference architectures that can help them with that. Uh, and with that, I will uh, pause if there's anything else uh, that we uh, need to address. You know, feel free to uh, reach out to us. But we've run uh, to the end of our time. So again, thank you for being patient. Uh, appreciate your time listening to this. And uh, go out, uh, try using containers, you know, share with us your feedback. I would love to hear from you.